Welcome to Prosecco and Prose, the epilogue. This week's Prosecco is our favorite go-to. Kirtland's signature is solo Prosecco Superiore. I don't think I'll ever get sick of this one. Nope. You know, we've never done a tasting of this one for our listeners. They've heard us on repeat say it's our go-to. Maybe we should let them know why. You're right, we haven't. Though I did do a comparison taste test with you this season. Remind me to never do a two-bottle episode again in the future. I went back and re-listened and my <laughs> tongue sounds so thick. <laughs> well, our job is to prosecco mm -hmm. and prose, but I hear you. However, with that being said, you were not able to fool this amateur sommelier. You're almost a pro, which makes me wonder, how much of this stuff do you really drink, Wendy? You're the one with the prosecco-filled hearse. Mm. I only fill my city girl wagon every once in a while. But I think it's like knowing the difference between Diet Coke and Coke Zero. Or like maybe canned cheese and Velveeta? Mm. Or even Boone's Farm and California Coolers. You know, I used to shoot that stuff using a garden hose with my friend Pam from high school. I think it's a bit more nuanced than that, Amy. But I think you get the picture. Oh, I learned something new about you every episode. Your poor parents. Mm -hmm. They survived. But we don't have time for small talk today. Let's start with the small price. How can you beat $6.99 a bottle? Not easily. And it's a DOCG. Mm -hmm. Now we've talked about DOC and DOCG on our Prosecco labels. The G is an additional guarantita or guarantee. Guarantita. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> by the Italian government that the wine is of specially high quality. Each DOCG labeled wine must pass a wine quality tasting panel. We should be on that panel, mm -hmm. obviously. Obviously. While DOC wines must merely be grown and made in accordance with the rules of the appellation. So they're obviously guaranteeing its quality and tastiness? I guess so, yeah. And we will further guarantee that with our tasting here. But first... Did you know the word superiore is also important in the labeling? Apart from declaring this Prosecco superior to other Proseccos? Mm -hmm. And this purple foil just screams royalty. It says, drink me, drink me. Yes, Alice, apart from that. I wondered if you'd pick <laughs> up on that. <laughs> Come on now. <laughs> superiore means that a wine has at least 0.5% higher alcohol content than the regular wine from a certain region, and also adheres to limits regarding harvesting and minimum aging. Didn't know that, but that sounds superiore to me as well. And speaking of, this one is unfortunately only an 11% mm. and an extra dry, right in the middle of the sweetness range. You would think superiore would be at least 50%. 50%? Mm. <laughs> we wouldn't be coherent. Probably not. I mean, if we are now. But this is not that kind of podcast, Amy. I do think it's so pretty. Mm -hmm. It's very pale, this clear gold color in the glass, nice bubbles, and definitely a citrusy smell. I describe it as a medium straw color. Just goes to show you my color wheel seems to be a bit from the farm. And yours, my dear, is from the city. Maybe if the city is Oz. I just feel like I'm borrowing Kristen's word. She used gold to describe those delicious ciders. Delicious, sock-smelling ciders. You know, the ones we sampled in our fun <laughs> Christmas episode? Oh, geez. She's a lot like me. Yes. Anything for a laugh. Now, thankfully, I am not getting her described sock smell. No. I'm getting a fruity... I'm just getting a really fruity scent right off the top. Mm -hmm. Strong pear. And as always, my favorite, the green apple. The floral for me really grows after it's had time to rest. Not getting the citrusy smell yet, though. Hmm. No floral for me. I find it mm. interesting when we get two quite different takes. Just like the literature. That's what keeps this really interesting. Maybe one of us has a crusty dragon blocking our smell sensors. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> Poor Casey McQuiston. Red, white, and royal blue will never be the same after Prosecco in not-so-posh prose. Discutere un romanzo. <laughs> I think they loved our added perspective, or dribble in that episode. Very true. But speaking of dribble, I'm ready to taste. Not that I don't know. Mm. Oh, wow. You can really taste the citrus. Mm. But I also get a lot of pear right up front. It's zingy, crisp, and refreshing. I'm going to stick with the fruit floral as I've got a strong peach flavor sloshing around my mouth. And of course, I can taste the green apple too. Sloshing around like in a trough? <laughs> <laughs> Don't think it's meant for that. Mm. 
Really? No citrus, though? Hmm. Well, now that you say that, it sort of finishes with a subtle, crispy, citrusy end. I just love messing around with you. You're just too easy. Not that easy. But you do, and it's all good fun. I'm very impressed with your growing palate. It's all this practice and careful barnyard study, of course. You know, you're really the one from the farm. And you the city. Mm -hmm. But I just love this Prosecco. Mm. It's just really good, easy to drink. It's our go-to. It's very easy to drink. One could almost say too easy. Mm -hmm. And the Perlage really isn't very strong in this one. Mm -mm. No shooting star bubbles like the last episode's prized bubbly. You mean the Corneliano Valdobbiadne Superiore? I'm just glad you didn't have me announce the Prosecco last episode. Would have been an epic failure. Probably not. By next season, your Italian will be episode ready. Maybe. Just have to stick to the I can learn to speak Italian in 15 minutes a day plan. You know, I was just thinking you could really get away with serving this bubbly at a high-end party. The guests would never know. It drinks like it's, you know, $20 or more a bottle. Hmm. Yeah, I think so. You'd have to pour it behind closed doors so they wouldn't see the Royal Purple Kirtland Budget Saver label, though. <laughs> exactly. But this is solo, still my favorite go-to, especially when the pocketbook is kind of tight. Yep. I love this Prosecco. Did you know a solo is the region? Really? So it's not actually part of the name? Really? I mean, it's part of the label, but like Valdobbiadene, it's a wine region. It's actually across the way from Valdobbiadene. And one more thing to go back to your farm girl color wheel. They use a farm girl color wheel? Actually, they just might. Hmm. This is from my research. A solo wines have a straw yellow color, fine effervescence, and floral and fruity aromas, usually reminiscent of apples, pears, citrus fruit, and white flowers. Well, hails bells and hallelujah. I told you I'd been practicing, but did it really say that? It did. And I just thought I ought to give credit where credit is due. Why, thank you. This wilderbilly has some skills. You are welcome. <laughs> <laughs> now, besides this Prosecco, I loved the season. Mm. So much great prose. So did I. And yes, such great prose. We're going to bookend our season with a little epilogue recap. Share some feedback and let you know our favorites. Our favorite Prosecco and pros. Mm-hmm, of course. We kicked off our season in the military month of November with a couple of military stories. Beyond the Point by Claire Gibson, paired with a Champagne Veuve Clicquot. We started with some fancy stuff. Mm, might have been a little too <laughs> fancy at $50 <laughs> a bottle. It was a special occasion, though, as we brought in our first guest, Sadie, a fellow military spouse and mom of West Point grads. She was so much fun and mm. quite the natural behind the mic. She was. Right. But I loved this story about women soldiers at West Point and beyond read a lot of military stories, but never one featuring women. And that was a lot of our feedback. It was nice to read a story that featured our military ladies. And a couple of people now want to attend a military ball after our grog talk. Who wouldn't? Our next episode was a short Mark Twain story, Luck, paired with It's a Head Snapper Prosecco. I love how you say that. It's a Head Snapper Prosecco. It's, it is a Head Snapper. <laughs> <laughs> now I have a question for you. Okay. Was that one lucky general or one jealous teacher? Good question. But we're going to leave that for the listeners. I agree. Now episode 13 was a thriller. The Guest List by Lucy Foley paired with a sparkling bottle of Gemma de Luna. Weddings, revenge in an Irish isle. Love the setting of that novel. And I love that you read a thriller. Mm. That was a story that kept us guessing. You got me hooked. I mean, how could you not be? But then it was off to the holidays with a children's Christmas classic, The Best Christmas Pageant Ever by Barbara Robinson, paired with a couple of sparkling apple ciders for our special guest, Kristen. And a couple of Christmas cocktails for us, baby. Mm-hmm. You know, I wasn't the only one who had missed out on this fantastic story as a kid. I had several respond to say they had also never read it before, but it became a new holiday favorite, especially with Kristen's commentary. Oh, to be a kid mm. again. And I loved that we could bring this sweet and funny story to the people. Episode 15 was The Third Policeman by Flan O'Brien, paired with Zardetto Prosecco. That was a tough one. Ooh, a little. Which has gotten a ton of hits in the last month. I don't know where it's coming from, but so fun. Because it's a good discussion. It was. It was definitely, though, a stretch for us. But we got 
we got some really good feedback on it. We did. And it was very nice because this one had us scratching our head at times. Like the whole time, <laughs> kind of. <laughs> this listener said that the third policeman read very crime and punishment s to him. Okay. I found that interesting. Yeah, but I can see that. It's very different than our look at it, but I like that. Mm -hmm, I agree. I love when we get feedback that makes you see a whole new side of a story. He also added that he loved our mention of the color yellow and the symbol of the Trinity. And I know you were really hesitant to go there. I was. I'm feeling a little <laughs> validated right now. <laughs> well, he said it brought to mind the idea of a sunrise and a resurrection. Hmm. Very interesting. I really like that idea in this story. Definitely another angle to take with this novel. It just goes to show that one person's thoughts can inspire another's. And one story can really stretch your reading range. We definitely stretched our <laughs> reading repertoire with that twisty circular story. But it was good and fun to discuss this listener request. The Zardetta wasn't bad either, was mm -mm. it? Mm. No, I liked it. Now, episode 16 was one I had been itching for you to read after we had a listener ask us to include some LGBTQ literature. Red, White, and Royal Blue by Casey McQuiston paired with a pretty bottle of Albino Armani. A little romance, a little first family in politics, a little royal family in monarchy, a fun story, and a delicious Prosecco. And a fun recurring line in the book that has inspired some not-so-delicious laughs. Oh, you mean Henry's saved name in Alex's phone? <laughs> So fun. HRH. Remember, His Royal Highness, just in case you forgot. I would. HRH, Prince Dickhead Poop Emoji. You should see what I have under your name in my phone. I'd rather not. Thank you. Nice touch with the bell. You mean Grandma Sue's bell. Grandma Sue's bell. Moving on. Episode 17 was the short story Ugly by Mary Gordon, paired with a pretty pink Prosecco. La Joyosa. Our first pink Prosecco. Mm -hmm. That short packed a lot in about the dynamics of appearances and fitting in. Yeah. Episode 18 was Britt Bennett's bestseller, The Vanishing Half, paired with a whole lot of Lavostra. We did have quite a bit of that Prosecco. <laughs> a little miscommunication between co-hosts. A little. This was a book I had been looking forward to and it didn't disappoint. Getting my palm read? That was a fun bonus. A very original story there. Episode 19 was another short story, The Rain That Falls on You From Nowhere by John Chu, paired with Menage a Trois Prosecco. Mm. This was another story that had me thinking. I'm glad I don't get dumped on when I tell a little fib. Me too. I also just, I really liked his writing style. Mm. There was something clean and to the point even though the narrator struggled to get to his. Hadn't thought of it in that way, but very true about our John Chu short. Now, our final episode... For the season. Yes, for the season. We are coming back. We are. We have a lot. Already have a stack. A huge stack. I know. Stack. I'm so excited about it. How do you pick? Um, All of them. Well, we're going to have some discussions. We will. Our season ender was the exquisite historical fantasy, The Invisible Life of Addie LaRue by V.E. Schwab, paired with Corneliano Valdobbiadene Prosecco. Oh my gosh. You... That was great cheers. That was fantastic. <laughs> I'm a big kid now. And your pampers? Sometimes I need them after too much bubbly. Always looking for a way to add a song. I've been practicing. And I'm a bathroom a joke. Wanted to surprise you. I'm impressed. <laughs> I'm not actually surprised because I have a lot of faith in you. Oh, we've been working 15 minutes a day. 15 minutes a day. Every day. Every day. Mm. Plus with our Italian podcast mm. to review mm -hmm. that we listen to. Mm -hmm. But that beautiful cover... With that beautiful bottle. So, let's talk favorites. What was your top Prosecco and Pros pick? Mm, my favorite Prosecco, easy peasy, was the pink La Joyosa. Mm, mm -hmm. The berry mango flavor was just so light and refreshing. Plus, saying I'm drinking a Mila Simato makes me sound cooler than I really am. You are cool. That was a good one. Favorite pros? Oh, by far, Addie LaRue. Mm. Schwab's writing was so lyrical. Every word so beautifully placed in exactly the right moment of the story. This is going to be a yearly read for me. What about you? What topped your list this season? So I went back and forth a bit, but my favorite Prosecco was the Corneliano Valdobbiadene. Mm. I love the perfumey smell, the tiny pretty bubbles, 
It was light with green apple and hints of citrus on the finish. Kind of reminds me of the Sassolo. That was a good one. I thought you might go with a head snapper though. I know you liked the pepper in it. It was a toss up between those, but I put the head snapper second. So did I. That one had tons of personality. I think it may be my go-to for a wine, cheese, and cracker gift basket. It's just really memorable. Especially with that colorful head snapper label. A very fun label. What about your favorite pros? My favorite pros was also Addie LeBrew. Mm. It was such a unique and beautiful beautiful story. It's kind of hard to put into words, but the characters, the setting, the span of time, all of it was just so, I mean, I loved it. What else can I say? I think that says it all. A book that leaves you speechless. Exactly. What else rounded out your top picks? It's hard for me to rank literature. Yeah. As I know a lot of work goes into the writing process and then putting it out there for everyone. You know, it's so personal, but reading and enjoying it is personal too, right? True. And I agree. But I bet even writers have their favorite reads. Oh, I'm sure of it. So the other two that rounded out my top three were Beyond the Point. I loved this book and the connection we made with Claire Gibson. Yeah. I loved how she really was able to give a true and well-researched peek into military life, you know, from the female perspective. Mm -hmm. She will be an automatic buy for me always. I love that story as well. And it was also in my top three. I loved the setting of West Point because, of course, I knew about it, but I had no idea what it would be like, except that it was hard. I know, a broad term to describe the West Point experience. Mm -hmm. And also, having been a former soldier, I really connected to the characters. That was an all-the-fails book, for sure. You know, you have those books in your life, mm -hmm. but it was an all-the-fails book. Yes, for sure. And then my next one was The Vanishing Half. This novel was just so rich in culture and addressed so many nuances of the Black community. Bennett wrote so unbiasedly, too. She has a gift. You know, she really has this gift of showing readers where unknown biases exist in a non judgmental way. Huge fan of hers. We'll always support this author's work, too. I really enjoyed that one as well, and it, too, rounded out my top three. I loved that it was a story I had not read before, and, you know, it opened my eyes to things I was not aware of at all. And I loved how she really showed all the sides of her characters, mm -hmm. and not as good or bad qualities, but just as qualities of humans. Right. Now, what about the shorts? We only did a few this season. That was kind of surprising to me, but, mm -hmm. you know, um, was there any one of them that just topped your list? Oh, I loved Mary Gordon's Ugly. <laughs> I mean... You know, I was sad Laura didn't stay at the beautiful place by the lake with all those pretty antiques, but I also completely understood why she left. That was also my favorite. First, there was the poetry. You know, I can't get away from the poetry. I know. And you know, we didn't have a lot of poetry in our prose this season. No, we didn't. And there was something about her setting. You know, the antiques, the love and friendship of Lois and Laura, the ignorance of Hugh. <laughs> it just really touched my radar strings. It was a good one. You know, something I noticed is we had a lot of discussion on identity, belonging, and love this season. Mm. Guess a good love story really is good for the soul. Who doesn't love love? And I loved some of our studio first this season too. Having guests in the studio, <laughs> a new learning curve. Yeah. I learned you, you know, you need to have the guest microphone on before recording. Oops. Poor Sadie. We had to record that one twice. But it was fun <laughs> because we got to hang out and day drink again. <laughs> I surely didn't feel bad about that. Not a bit. Now, I think one of my favorite reader comments was from the late lady who told us she totally writes down our book club discussion talking points, you know, so she doesn't have to come up with her own, especially when she's pressed for time. Uh, Amy, I think she said she secretly does that when she gets to pick the novel and you just blabbered her secret to everyone. Oops. Mm, oops. <laughs> I didn't say who it was. True. I was just so impressed that someone would even think of doing that. Not even mad. It's like book clubberism. I know, right? And I see your portmanteau, you know, club and plagiarism. But just so you know, you know, clubberism really isn't a word, Wendy. It is now. I mean, if you can invent words, 
I think I can invent words. Touche, Wendy. Touche. All right. Anything else before we call this season a wrap? Just want to let everyone know to please feel free to continue to connect with us on any of our social media or email. We are still open to recommendations for future seasons, short stories or novels. Or if you just want to connect. Right. We've got a few things up our sleeve for the break, so be sure to subscribe so you don't miss a thing. Or hit the follow button. Now, Wendy, Apple is changing the subscribe button to follow. Oh. Totally free to subscribe or follow and you'll be the first to know when season three drops in June. And again, totally free, mm -hmm. but hugely appreciated to rate and or review us. Dissertation, not needed. Definitely not. Just a few words to let others know why you listen. Loving the review so far. Oh, that's nice. I know. I think in next season, we need to go through and, you know, really start giving shout outs to all those who review us. Great idea. I know. I'm full of them today. You are. And there's some really good ones on Apple. And hopefully more to come. Well, what do you think, my friend? Cheers to season two. Yep. Cheers to some great pros. And to some really great Prosecco. Until next season, I guess we've really only got one last request. Pop a cork and read. <laughs> <laughs>